Autumn is the gateway to the cold and darkness of winter. It is a time when all big and small seek out their kin and together make preparations to survive the dipping temperatures and the bone-chilling dangers that may lurk in the dark. Villagers in the Banat Mountains of Western Romania harvest the hay for their cattle, while the wolves in the wilderness nearby, rarely seen by the villagers, start organising their packs and grow warmer coats so as to fend off the chilling winds. Encounters between humans and wolves are rare in the region, with some claims that the light-footed hunters have not been seen in most villages for close to a century. After all, they are known to fear and thus actively avoid humans and their settlements. But in the autumn of 1958, a lone wolf with a thirst for blood would prowl not one, but two villages, and seemingly seek with intent and purpose to hunt down and eliminate the members belonging to the same family. And it very almost succeeded, killing three of them and disfiguring two more. The wolf, it was claimed, had set out to fulfil a generational curse, one that's purpose was to extinguish, once and for all, an entire family's lineage, and in doing so avenge its instigator after decades of despair, grief, and bloody unresolved conflict. My name is Laura, and you are watching The Paranormal Scholar. The case which follows took place in an ancient land, a world of lush greenery and time-worn trees, wicked-limbed and racked by wind. And so it is fitting then that I ask you to allow a brief interlude for me to introduce the equally aberracious sponsor of this video, Established Titles. Established Titles is a fun and novel way to enable you to call yourself Lord or Lady, all while preserving the natural woodlands of Scotland and helping global reforestation efforts. Based on a historic custom whereby Scottish landowners are referred to as lairds or lords and ladies, established titles title packs give you at least one square foot of dedicated land on a private estate in Edelston, Scotland. Formalised by an official certificate bearing a crest, each title comes with a unique plot number which allows you to identify the exact location of your land. Such declares you in perpetuity to be known by the style and title of Lord or Lady, meaning you could officially change your name to Lord or Lady and thus restyle yourself as such on plane tickets, credit cards, and even when making a difficult to decline last minute table reservation at your favourite restaurant. Most wonderful of all, however, is how established titles plants a tree with every order, with them working with the global charities One Tree Planted and Trees for the Future. A marvellously eccentric way to augment your status, these souvenir title packs also make wonderful gifts, most especially at the last minute, with their couples packs even coming with adjoining plots of land. And better still, Established Titles has told me that the first 200 people purchasing a title pack using my link will effectively be next to my plot. So depending upon how many of you want to become a lord or a lady, we can build our own wondrously peculiar paranormal kingdom them together in the midst of Scotland. At the moment, Established Titles is running a suitably grand Black Friday sale, plus if you use the code Paranormal Scholar, you will get an additional 10% off. Simply go to establishedtitles.com forward slash Paranormal Scholar to get your gifts, all while helping global reforestation efforts in a unique and memorable way. Thank you for listening, and thus helping to support my channel. Now on with the video. Surrounded by green meadows, clear lakes, and virgin forests, the pastoral villages at the foothills of the Banat Mountains in Western Romania seem frozen in time. Here, Mother Nature claims her primacy, ever nurturing ancestral beliefs that the dead can return from their graves as strigoi or vampires, and the living can become cursed to transform into fearsome beasts and werewolves. Stories of the restless dead and cursed beasts that remind us of a world beyond our understanding are still told today, in nearly every village at the foothills of the Banat Mountains. In particular, local people recount their own version of an old legend concerning a husband and wife harvesting the hay in the fields together, when the husband transformed into a wolf and attacked his wife. 
One such village is that of Puyen in Timish County, an otherwise inviting settlement with its dark fairy tale charm and hiking trails. Puyen is seen as a natural refuge from the fuss of the city, a place where one can bid farewell to their mobile phone signal as soon as they cross the bridge at the entrance to the village. It has been described by many as a place shrouded in profound nostalgia, with a history spanning over 500 years. A history that seems to be, at times, paranormal. One of the more recent and tragic events in the history of the village took place in the autumn of 1958. And although it is reminiscent of the old legend of the husband and wife harvesting hay together, the tragedy that happened then was all too real. It was a warm afternoon in the middle of September, when everyone from grandparents to grandchildren worked together in the fields, harvesting the hay and preparing it for winter. Maria Sabu, her mother and her two-year-old daughter Elena were tending to their harvest unaware that a fearsome beast was lurking nearby, watching their every move. When they finished harvesting the hay, they began descending the hill, steadily heading toward the village, when what is said to have been an unclean wolf created by curse attacked them from behind. It first lunged at Maria, viciously biting her head before turning on her mother, whose head and neck it mutilated beyond recognition. In the attack, the women rolled downhill all the way onto the dirt road, where the wolf caught up with them and continued attacking, sinking its teeth deeper into their faces. Through the ordeal, Maria summoned all her power to protect her daughter. At first, she hid Elena under her skirt, and then under a wooden crate that was used as a makeshift stroller at the time. The wolf tried to attack the little girl as well, but was unable to reach her. Maria later described how the vicious beast only pretended to slightly scratch her face, and did not seem so focused on the child. Instead, it directed all of its brutality towards the mother and grandmother. And so, after terrifying the child, and severely wounding and disfiguring the two women, the wolf disappeared, supposedly just as suddenly as it had appeared. Describing her ordeal years later, Maria told a journalist, I fell down, and I lost consciousness for a while. Then, when I came to my senses, I crawled to the edge of the stream to wash my eyes. I barely walked back home. I held my poor mother, who was bitten worse than I. I held her by her clothing and pulled her behind me in the only way that I could. With one hand, I held my crying child. With another, I held my mother. We arrived home, and there the people put us in a horse carriage and took us to the train station in a nearby town, and from there to the hospital in Timishwara. Unbeknownst to Maria, the wolf returned up the hill to where another woman from her family had arrived moments prior looking for her. Without hesitation, the wolf attacked her too, tearing away one of her ears and part of her scalp. Then, as if guided by an intelligently crafted plan, the wolf left her. After all, it had other tasks to complete that day, other victims to reach, all from the same family. In mere hours thereafter, the wolf, leaving a gruesome and bloody trail in its wake, travelled some twenty kilometres from Puyen to the outskirts of another village, where Maria's husband was spending the night at a hut near a sheepfold, together with his sister and brother-in-law. By now, it was dark. The three heard the sheep and the guard dogs becoming increasingly agitated and loud, and so Maria's husband went outside to find the cause of the unrest. He swiftly spotted the wolf, staring at him, seemingly uninterested in the other animals. And so he began screaming and shouting, knowing that loud noises were supposed to scare the wolf away. The intimidation tactic that the villagers in the mountains have passed down from generation to generation is said to chase away any wild animal, but chillingly, the wolf did not flinch. Instead, the fearsome creature lunged at him, ripping off half of his face and dismantling his jaw so that he could no longer scream or speak. Terrified at what they were hearing outside, his brother-in-law grabbed a pitchfork, while his sister walked out of the hut, holding a lamp to illuminate the darkness. 
As soon as the wolf saw the lamp, it lunged straight at it to extinguish the light. And once the light was extinguished, the beast attacked the woman, ripping off her nose and cheeks. All the while, her husband yelled at her to push the wolf off, to get away from it, to do anything to break its spine if she could. But the woman was on the ground, unable to escape the wolf's fangs. And so, desperate to save his wife, the man attempted to break its spine by hitting it with the handle of the pitchfork, which is said to have broken in half upon impact, barely harming the wolf at all. The wolf was relentless and unyielding, its viciousness seemed without end, but then, in a moment of sheer luck, the man was able to grab the wolf's neck and pleaded with his wife to kill it. Thus, pulling a clasp knife from her belt and summoning all her strength and courage, she shoved her arm up to her elbow inside the wolf's jaws. As it began to chew on her arm, she slashed it from the inside, killing it and putting an end to the wolf's savagery through a savage act of her own. A sensational and extraordinary tale, one which surely suggests fraudulence or embellishment. And yet, it is true, as is proven by the legacy which it left. After all, tragically, only two days after the attack, Maria's mother, husband and brother-in-law all passed away from their severe injuries. Little Elena lost her father, with her mother and her aunt being left terribly disfigured. And so the wolf took much that dreadful day. It, so it has been claimed, also gave something of its ferocious and unnatural presence to those who survived its attacks, for this, by all accounts, was no ordinary wolf. Moved to the hospital in Timisoara along with its victims, the body of the bloodthirsty creature was able to be examined by doctors. The wolf, it was claimed, was female, and yet, unusually, only had two mammary glands. Not merely that, but it seemed to have left no traces of its presence in or around the villages it had prowled, despite the many victims it had made. In this way, immediately after the attack, the locals and authorities in the two villages spent several days scouring the forests in the area, looking for the traces that were supposed to have been left by the wolf and its pack. But they found none, no traces and no pack. Not merely that, rabies seems to have been ruled out by those who inspected the body, ruling out the idea of a rabid lone wolf. To add an even more unsettling layer to the mystery, there had been no traces of wolves at all in the area for decades, in fact, for almost close to a century. A representative of the town hall, who was also a hunter and thus knew his way around the wooded region, told a journalist that real wolves in the area are extremely rare and that they would never descend among villagers. Many of the elderly people living in Poyen and the neighbouring villages likewise claim to have never seen wolves in their entire lives, and so to them, the tragedy of 1958 was all the more mystifying. Even for the zoologists who have looked into the case, the tragedy had no rhyme or reason because wolves never attack human beings unless they are rabid, and under no circumstance do they eat humans. And yet, the wolf had eaten half of the faces of Maria and her sister-in-law. Certainly, the attack was so vicious and their wounds so unimaginable that they were left disfigured beyond recognition for the rest of their lives. And so, for the two women and their neighbours in the village, what had happened was not random. They believed that the attack was a curse meant to end Maria's family lineage, and that it became embodied in the form of a wolf, or a prikolic, as it is referred to in Romanian folklore. The prikolic is a type of were-people, either born, cursed or bitten, and thus corrupted by the curse of the wolf. The survivors of the attack and the villagers were convinced that the she-wolf was such a creature, and perhaps even the embodiment of a woman who was supposed to be long dead. It is said that decades before the attack of the cursed wolf, someone in Maria's family took the life of another villager to rob him of a very precious weapon with a silver hilt. It is believed that no justice was served after this awful crime. And so the mother of the victim took matters into her own hands, or rather, her soul. She was a very old woman, and the victim was her only son. 
It is said that at the funeral, heartbroken and with nothing left to lose, the grieving mother gave in to her wrath and cast a curse on the killer, and swore to extinguish his family lineage as he had extinguished hers. And in casting the curse, she had cursed herself in the process, and thus transformed herself into the very weapon of her vengeance, the wolf. Until their deaths in the early 2000s, Maria and her sister-in-law believed that they had survived the curse of that she-wolf, but at a great cost, having lost everything from their loved ones to their very faces, and even a bit of their humanity. Before her passing, Maria spoke openly to a journalist, describing her ordeal through mournful tears and grieving sighs, warning those who would listen to her that curses are as real as the wolf that disfigured her. What more could I say, she told the journalist. I have walked on those dirt roads since I have known myself, and I had never seen wolves before, or in the time since. Until about a year ago, my sister-in-law was still alive, bitten on the head like me. People used to speak of us as if we were miracles. Now she has died, and I am the only one left, so that people can be terrified of me, so that they continue to tell the tales and remember that curses do not ever die. Heartbreakingly, Maria also told the journalist, two and a half years I spent there in the hospital and I still am no longer human. I haven't been human since." The journalist noted that Maria's face could not be described in words, and that the marks of the beast were so frightening that it made her believe that perhaps unwittingly, Maria may have borrowed something from the wild and unnatural qualities of the wolf that attacked her. Not merely that, the press representative also noted that, while interviewing Maria inside her house, her camera did not work nor respond properly, and so she was unable to take any photos of her. Likewise, her recorder froze, rendering it impossible to capture Maria's words. And chillingly, the car which brought the journalist to the house, and which was parked at the gate, was hit by a log truck. Despite the unsettling occurrences, the journalist dismissed them completely because she did not want to ponder whether those were signs that indeed there was a paranormal reality attached to the tragedy that took place in 1958. And so, hesitant, the modern mind, if not dismissive of the paranormal, prefers not to tackle the possibility at all. However, the dwellers of the Banat Mountain share Maria's perspective on the tragedy, and do not shy away from openly talking about their belief in werewolves. Although real wolves are extremely rare in the region, werewolves are believed to be more common, for they are human beings who have inherited a curse, or who have been cursed themselves as a result of spiritual and ritualistic transgressions. A villager from Puyen claimed that those who do not renounce their sinful ways and live without reconciliation, nestling transgressions in their soul, are punished to never find their rest neither in this world or the next, and cursed to roam as wolves, as strigoi, or as dogs without a master. Another villager, abiding by the same views, claimed that his uncle would have fits of seeming insanity and undress completely, roll over three times, and turn into a wolf, after which he would disappear for days without a trace. And equally sensational, in the village of Borlova, the late 1950s were likewise believed to have been haunted by a raging prickolich, one that would transform not into a wolf, but some sort of sinister bear. According to a witness account, the first attack of the Prickolich happened when a group of men went outside the village to a stream to set up fish traps. One of them wandered away from the rest, only to return a short while later in beast form as a sort of bear. He attacked the other men, two of which were father and son, who attempted to fight off the beast with the sticks and twigs they were able to reach on the ground. But it was all to no avail. The creature slashed the belly of the father, tore out one of the eyes of his son, and badly injured the rest of the group. All men survived the attack, and were treated for their wounds, although they were left scarred and traumatized for the rest of their lives. 
In the weeks that followed, rumours began to spread about the Prickolich and the man who was suspected to be behind the beast. But the people had no proof to sustain their claims, other than the fact that he had wandered away from the group just before the attack, and was the only one left unharmed. He was also supposedly cursed due to him being a third generation born out of wedlock. Chillingly, the suspected man is also said to have confided in some locals that he would feel extremely nauseous before turning into the beast. To turn, he claimed to cover himself in a bear hide that would metamorphose with him, thus transforming him into the fearsome creature. Months later, the suspect, alongside the father and son who were previously with him, joined a group of forest rangers to do some work in the woods. On one of the nights there, the man suspected to be the beast left his hut, believing everyone else to be asleep. However, the father who survived the previous attack was vigilant, and realizing that another attack might be underway, he alerted the others to be ready. A short while later, the beast reportedly emerged from the dense woods and lunged at the group of men. Horrified, they prepared their weapons and took the beast down. They then put it in a makeshift coffin, no longer than a walking stick, which they carried back into the town. They did not allow the locals to peek inside, but claimed that the coffin contained the carcass of the feared beast. Thereafter, the attacks completely ceased. As for the suspected man, he had vanished, never to be seen again. The people believe that if the Prickolich dies in animal form, it remains that way, and so the locals were certain that the man suspected was indeed the monstrous creature whose attack stopped when he himself disappeared. Whether you believe that werewolves are real or not, the 1958 massacre of the Cursed Wolf is a gut-wrenching tragedy that unequivocally disfigured two women, took the lives of three people, and victimised two villagers, whose locals even today tremble when remembering Maria and her sister-in-law. The two brave women, not to mention the little girl they left behind, were never the same again. The she-wolf had scarred them, leaving marks that ran as deep as their very souls. Thank you so much for watching, and indeed thank you to my dear friend Radiana for once again researching and writing for the Paranormal Scholar. If you enjoyed this, you might like to explore more of her work, either through one of our previous videos together, or indeed by watching one of her own wonderful and truly scholarly offerings on her channel. The links to these are on screen now. Until next time, 